Hello, everyone. Welcome to the DNB Business Show. I'm your host, Odo Sevilla, and today I have a very special guest for you, Gus Hamden. Gus is the owner and founder president of Improver Modeling. Welcome to the show, Gus. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm honored to be here. Oh, thank you. You're so the kind. I, I appreciate you being on. Um, so Absolutely. before we get into your remodeling business, I like to get the audience to get to know you as a person a little bit more. Are you originally from the DMV, DC, Maryland, Northern Virginia area? Yes and no. <laughs> so, and I say that because, so the short answer is no. I was born and raised in Beirut, Lebanon. Um, beautiful place. Uh, unfortunately, got destroyed a few times over the years. But uh, about 20 years ago, I moved to the States and the DMV was the very first place I moved to. Um, so, which is why I say yes and no. So I wasn't born in the DMV or in the States, but the DMV is my second home. So you grew up in Beirut, Lebanon, right? I did. And you were around how old when you left Lebanon? I was 20. 20. Okay. Oh, wow. So a big, big part of your life there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. How, so I've spent half of my life there, half of my life here at this point, which is kind of cool. How was it growing up in Beirut? Um, so if I were to use one word, I would say crazy, um, <laughs> in a good and a bad way. It was, it was good when it's good and unfortunately not so good when it was bad. Um, and I say that because, you know, we try to make, we, we always try to make the best out of it. And as Lebanese people were, we, we, we love to have fun. We love to party. We love to live life to the fullest, right? And so even when things aren't all that great, we try to make the best out of that situation. Um, you know, unfortunately, we're, we, we, got, we got used to, um, you know, the bombing and things not being, you know, so perfect. Um, we got accustomed to it and we, you know, we can basically switch back and forth at any moment. <laughs> um, it's a little bit different now that I've been in the States for 20 years. So my lifestyle and, you know, it's a little different, obviously the States and the way things are here are different. And so I can't say I'm used to that lifestyle anymore, but sure. you know, typically the Lebanese people, that's just the kind of, it's, it's a mindset. So growing up in Beirut, God, was it mostly just, I guess, running to bomb shelter? You mentioned crazy, or is that what you remember the most? Or how was it as a kid? I, I'm sure, you know, you played around, whether in playground, school, oh, street, sure. right? Absolutely. Uh, so for the most part, it was all great. Um, we, you know, we played around on the streets for sure. We were, you know, I mean, we, we lived right on the Mediterranean. I could see the Mediterranean from my bedroom window. That's how close we lived. And, you know, I remember every summer, you know, uh, myself and my sister would just go and spend 12 hours a day at the beach, at the Mediterranean. It's just, you know, by ourselves, no supervision. I'm talking like, you know, we were, you know, 12, 13, 14 years old. Yeah. Um, and so those are the, the good memories. And, you know, we have, again, just being close to the water, so close to the water, give us a lot of opportunity. Um, as a kid, as a young kid, we, uh, you know, every summer we'd go to Cyprus, for example, right? We had a, like a cabin, if you will, at the beach, and we just spent the entire summer there and then just take a, either a boat back or, a, you know, a short, you know, flight back home, um, and to, to go on with, with, with life again. So, um, but yeah, I mean, other, otherwise, I mean, it's from, otherwise from the, all the bad stuff for the most part, I, I would say I had a great childhood. Um, just, you know, grateful for, to be able to live there then see how things are here in the States. Uh, not many people, unfortunately, get to experience that, to see different cultures and different things like that. So I'm just grateful and, uh, you know, proud of it. You know, that, that's, that's the nice thing when being a foreigner, and of course, depending on what country you're from, but you become very appreciative of what this country, the United States, is able to offer us. Because, so appreciative. Yes. To be honest with you, every opportunity I get, I like to talk about that for a little bit because we, we tend to take things for granted. We take to, because this is our norm now, right? We have things at our fingertips and for the most part, our problems are 
the internet is down for five seconds or you know um what am i gonna eat today i can't make a decision you know my life is about to end <laughs> and so and obviously i'm i'm going to the extreme here but yes. you know you know what i mean so we have so much that's available to us here in the states that this country has to offer it's incredible and so and the fact that we take so much of it into you know uh you know granted it's, it's just a it's sad but at the same time i also understand why people do that because they're not they they, they, they that's what they're used to that's the norm you know yeah you know it, it, it's true and um I, I like yourself i'm also an immigrant even though i was raised here i came here at a very very young age and grew up in mm. the dc metro area um but i would always go back home to visit family in my country and, and mm. it's a third world country and you just get a deep appreciation of the opportunity you have here in the united states and and then i would come home and i would see it even in the neighborhood where i would grow up about and you would see other students and they're not just they're they're just not taking advantage of their life and i would see it as a kid and i was like it would be so sad because i know what the other point is just like you mentioned um absolutely yes absolutely we have especially now and the what the way things changed after covid um there's so much that kids nowadays can do that's available to them and even back then but now more than ever in my opinion is is it's just, it's endless amount of tools and resources that are available to not just kids but also adults yeah do, do you have any children yourself i do have four okay oh wow uh you're yeah. a busy man <laughs> very much so <laughs> I, I, I have I have three little ones myself, and I, I thought oh, wow. I was uh, I had my handful, but now yeah, you have four. You beat me there. <laughs> yeah, and a dog. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah, me too. <laughs> there you go. Nice. That, that's my girl. I have three boys, and uh, my dog is the girl. There you go. I like it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But but even with my kids, and I'm mentioning kids because you know they grew up here. They're born in America. And um, nowadays, I don't know the age of yours, but most of them is just they need a screen in front of their face. Not all of them. I don't. I don't want to. But it's whether TV, tablet, computer, phone, you name it. And you just want to sort of take them away. And even to a point, I'm always thinking of maybe sending them to a summer to a foreign country. Just you know, because my wife is also an immigrant, and just just for them to see, even though we've traveled. Uh, also to other countries with them, but to, it's different when you're there for the full summer than just going there for a week or two with mom and dad. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's funny because my wife and I were just talking about this the other day. Um, she, she was born in DC, but her parents are from Bolivia. And so she's fluent in Spanish and she's been there. Um, she actually lived from age six to age 12 and then visited a few times over the years after that. And so we were just talking about this, that maybe we should we should send them there for for the summer just to kind of learn the culture, learn the language, you know, just learn a different way of living yeah. and kind of remind them what it's like to be outside and play with dirt and, you know, stuff like that. Because, I mean, that's what we did as kids. Right. Yeah. But the other part of this is I'm also fully aware that this is the life that they have to grow up with because this is where the world is heading. Right. Um, you know, when they become our age, their generation, if they didn't know technology, if they're not up to speed on things, they will miss the boat. So to a certain extent, I'm okay with it. Um, it's because it's just reality, you know. Yeah. Um, I don't, we don't necessarily limit them too much to watch time or things like that, as long as it's educational. So I always have that conversation about it argument if you will with the little ones especially like if you're gonna be on youtube it better be educational you better be learning something from it and i want you to come back and tell me all about it you know what i mean mm -hmm. so um so again i'm okay with it to a certain extent because i'm fully aware that this is where the world and this is where kids are heading from here you know yeah no no it's so, very true very true so you you, yeah. you leave lebanon at 20 prior to you leaving beirut are you in school? Are you working or how does it look? Both. Okay. Um, so I started working at age 14. I worked for a photographer. I was the assistant. I was the one that back in the day where 
you know, camcorders had cables. <laughs> so I was the one just carrying the cable and just going behind the videographer and, you know, assisting with whatever they needed. And I fell in love with that. Um, so we did that, you know, for events, weddings and things like that on weekends and evenings. And during the day when I, in the summertime, um, and again, I'm talking, you know, again, 14, 15, 16 is when I did that every summer. Um, I would just go to the shop and, you know, uh, either help on the front counter or, you know, go out back to the lab and watch people, you know, develop and process pictures and, th and things of that nature. Um, things that we don't see anymore, unfortunately, <laughs> but yeah, that's the cool stuff. Um, at the same time, after high school, I uh, did about, I would say a year and a half of college there. I did hospitality manager management. Um, that's what I was trying to major in. And then, you know, my green card showed up in the mail 10 years later. <laughs> <laughs> so I packed my bags, put 300 bucks in my pocket and left. With $300. $300. Wow. Did, yeah. So back then, were you, were you interested in going into the hospitality or hotel industry or what were your thoughts? I was. Okay. I was. Plus also it was a little trendy. <laughs> mm -hmm. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And that kind of appealed to me more than most. And so I was like, I was like, you know what, let me just give it a try and let me play around with it because not only am I going to learn hospitality, but I'm also going to learn business management, which I can leverage down the road as well. Um, so I said, you know, my thought was, let me start with that at least. And then if things change down the road is what it is, but that's, uh, that's what I was trying to get. Yeah. It was fun. So, so you leave a with $300 in your pocket, one way yep. to take it to the DC area or where, yep. where do you land? To Maryland. Maryland. Okay. So yep. you have Dallas family, Airport. family here. Correct. So I did. Um, I did have an uncle that I allowed me to stay with for a couple of months. And then shortly after I got a job, moved in with, with roommates and started my life. The life of an immigrant here is not, a, yes. not always easy. It's not. But we also have very strong work ethics, as I'm sure you know, um, which, you know, sometimes uh, bad, but most times it's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, but it's it's all good stuff. How, how was it, Gus, when when you when you arrive here? You come to Maryland, you know an uncle, but then pretty much it's all brand new to you. So, did it's you know any English? I knew very very basic English. So my number one goal was to learn English. My number two goal is to lose my accent, even though I still have it and it comes out once in a while. But I worked extremely hard. So when I wasn't working, I was on the couch in front of the TV with closed captioning on the TV and just reading subtitles as I read the lips. And that's exactly how I taught myself English. And in the evening when the TV was off, I played music. And so it was all English. When I got a job, um, I purposely did not want to work with Lebanese people or anybody that spoke anything other than English, because again, I made it such a, it was such a big deal for me. Because I knew if, it, if, if I had an accent, if I didn't know the language, I wasn't going to blend in with society well. And so in order for me to do that, you know, I made that my priority and I went full force. And, you know, I guess things worked out a little bit. <laughs> so when you come here as an immigrant, many people just try to find a job and anything just to get income and money in their pocket. Was it similar to you or did you already have, um, what, what were you doing when you arrived? Yeah, I absolutely have flipped burgers at McDonald's. Yes. So I, I did that for about 10 days and I got called in for another interview at a job at a studio back in the day when Motive Photo was in business. I don't know if you remember, but um, I had applied and then, you know, waited a couple of weeks and never got a call. I went back, applied again, still didn't get a call, um, then just, you know, got tired of it and, you know, I was running low on cash. And so I just went to the McDonald's across the street from there and put an application and sure enough, within 24 hours, mm -hmm. I had my costume on. <laughs> there you go. Um, and then, uh, you know, 10 days later, luckily they called me back, um, from the first place. And because again, I had a passion for photography, design, things like that, left McDonald's and went after my dream job <laughs> at yeah. the time. So at the time, that was your dream job, photography. Did, did yes. you stay that for a while or did you, I, I assume that you transitioned to something else eventually, right? 
I did. So I worked at that one location for about two years, and then I got promoted to an assistant manager at a different location. So I moved from the Bethesda store to Chevy Chase. And then within six months, they promoted me to a store manager in Laurel. And then shortly after I was there, I was running both locations, Laurel and Annapolis. Um, and I was with a company for about six years altogether. Oh, so wow. that goes back yeah. to the work ethics, right? I always strive to go get to a higher positions within companies and reach, you know, always had like big goals. I wanted to, you know, get higher and higher yeah. within the company. And so um, that journey lasted about six years. Then I was recruited by CVS Pharmacy. Um, at the time, Motofoto was starting, you know, slowly to go out of business. The digital world started, um, digital cameras, sort of, you know, um, video cameras and so on and so forth. So there was much less demand for film. And so they started closing down stores and the district manager for Motofoto at the time left and started working for CVS Pharmacy as a regional photo lab manager. So she recruited me as a photo lab supervisor at, at a location. And, you know, that's when I left the first company, started working for CVS Pharmacy. Within six months, I was a store manager for CVS. And then I was with them for, I would say, four years. Um, from there, I dabbled a little bit more with retail, I worked for Macy's. I was their men's department manager. And that's when I found home improvement. So, you know, went through a little bit of transition there until I found what I didn't know back then that I, it was going to be my passion now. Um, and the rest is history. You know, I, I like retail myself because it, it gave me, it wasn't my first job, but it gave me the start, mm -hmm. especially it allowed me to have flexibility, which is what I needed when I was in, in school full time. So I was in school full time in college and at the same time working full time in retail, but because retail is open on weekends too, you're, I was able to structure the hours that I was able to make income full time retail and at the same time focus on schoolwork full time. Um, sure. So th th that's great that you gave a lot of years of your career to the, to the retail industry. I think everybody should at some point for, you know, even for a short period of time. Because it teaches you a few things for sure. Yeah, you definitely. It, it definitely teaches you to appreciate different things and other things. Yeah. Because, you know, what you go through and, uh, you know, I think uh, the customer ser service aspect of it as well is very important. I agree. So from retail, then you moved to home remodeling, you said, right? I did. I did. So um, my daughter was born. She uh, She's now 10. Um Shortly before she was born, I started looking around for different things to do, um, better income. Um, my wife at the time was very pregnant and, you know, all our babies were, were heavy, but that one was the heaviest. She was born uh, nine pounds and six ounces. So it put her on a bed dress for a little while. So and we didn't know when she was going to go back to work. So sure enough, I started looking for different things because we went from two incomes down to one. And, you know, as I was looking through, I think at the time was Craigslist ad. Um, I don't even know if they still exist anymore. And I found, um, without naming names, one of the big players in the industry and started in sales with them. It literally took about a month for me to make, to make that decision because it was a 100% commissioned position. And I just didn't know anything about home improvement. But the one thing I did know is no risk, no reward, right? Uh, nothing changes if nothing changes. So I had to make that change. And I just took it and, you know, promised myself and my family that I'm going to, I'm just going to make it. I have no room to fail. Sure. And so um, I was basically in the office before anybody. I was out the last person because I wanted to know everything about the industry, everything about the business, everything about the products. And, you know, I need to make myself better. I need to, you know, I help myself very high standards. And so the only way to do it is to just eat, sleep, breathe everything that I do, which is the home improvement at the time, which is so. The, the company, is, is it a local company or national? It's a local company. Okay. I, the reason I'm asking, was, was there any training at all involved, Gus? Or they're just like, hey, go out there and very go sell? Little. Oh, very little. Very okay. little. Yeah, so the training consisted of, hey, go shadow a manager twice in the field 
and here's your bag and let me know if you need anything. <laughs> that was my training. <laughs> wow. So you're there selling all types of home remodeling projects or was there started any... with started with windows, doors and siding. Okay. And then eventually got into roofing. Um, stayed with them for about five years to kind of walk you through that journey a little bit. I was, uh, I was their top performer the very first year, my first full year, I was their top performer for that office. Um, two years after that, by choice, I finally got into management. They had tried to convince me for a while and I didn't want to do it. It's too much responsibility, this and that. And, uh, I was just having fun in the field. Um, didn't want to sit behind a desk. And so uh, finally, they convinced me and I was their sales manager. Um, I had about 12 to 15 employees under me. Um, had a lot of fun, uh, made good money. It was good. And then got into a disagreement with them um, and got recruited by another big player in the industry. Started Also started in sales and then a couple of years into it. Once again, got convinced into getting into management. <laughs> um, a year later, I was their VP of sales and marketing responsible for $60 million office. Until 2019, shortly before COVID, I decided to just leave and start my own company. Then, as we all know, shortly after COVID hit, um, and then I decided in May 2020, what a better day or when a better time to start a new company than now. So. Let's go. <laughs> and sure enough, just went for it. That's awesome. Because I want to briefly go back to your two sales roles there. Was it was it cold calling or were you getting warm leads from somewhere and then you were going to people's homes and presenting or how was it? Yeah, so all the leads came in. Um, I, was, I never cold called. Well, I was never required to cold call. Mm -hmm. I personally cold called because it's just my nature. I wasn't gonna just sit stagnant and do nothing when leads were slow. So um, the leads came in, they got confirmed, and then I was the guy that went to the home, sat and negotiated at the kitchen table. Got it, okay. Mm -hmm. you, you, so. you mentioned you were number one in that first role within the first year. And then I'm, I'm sure also the second company, since you moved up so fast, also, you were probably one of the top, if not the top performer. I was number two. <laughs> I, I'm curious, what, in your opinion, you, you would see other people there in similar roles and they would be behind. What did you think it was that got you above everyone else, whether one or two? Um, I would say work ethics, honestly. I had the same opportunity everyone had, you know which goes back to one of the things that I typically talk about when we talk about the opportunities in the United States, we all have the same opportunities. The same thing in that role. We all had the same opportunities. The difference between me and the other guy is when I wasn't on a lead, I knock on doors. When I wasn't on a lead, I cold call. When I was on a lead, I followed up and I followed through. And I was in my manager's face and you know, bugging him all day, every day. Hey, I'm here. I got a full tank of gas. I got to go. Like, where are you sending me? That was me. You know, <laughs> I just going to sit still. It's um, good that they saw the motivation. Absolutely. And, yes. you know, most people, if they're not handed a sheet of paper with, you know, a name and address on it, they just sat home, did nothing. That wasn't me. <laughs> so I was, I was out there. I was just doing. Good. So. And, and, and a lot of people probably don't do just because maybe they don't want to, they're lazy, or maybe they're just afraid that they'll get no's, but that's just part of it. Of course, they're just content. You know, I'm not okay making 40 grand, 50 grand a year. You know, it, it just wasn't me. A lot of people are. Mm -hmm. And you know what? And that's okay. Sure. You know, I don't say this in, in a disrespect or anything. You know, there are, we're just different. It's just different breed. Yeah, that's true. You know? So in 2019, you have the idea, I'm going off on my own, right? And then right. it's in 2020 was when the company was founded and established. Correct. Okay. And it, it, what made you decide, what were you thinking? You're like, this is the time, it's now or never? Now or never. So I always had the idea of starting a virtual home improvement company. Right. So the whole sitting at the kitchen table and pressuring people, which I never did. I, I'm very much against pressuring people into buying, um, you know, building urgency and a need is one thing, but 
begging people to sign the dotted line today or the offer leaves with me was not my style at all. Um, and so, and because of that in the industry and so much of it basically across the board with every company, I wanted to do things differently. I wanted to start an all virtual meeting, like we're on a Zoom call right now. If you don't like what I'm saying, click end and you can get rid of me easily. I yeah. wanted to give that people that peace of mind that they can get rid of me at any time. So if, if you see the value in me and what I have to offer, great. I'm happy to work with you. Otherwise, we're okay. We can part friends and life goes on. Yes. I'm okay with that too. And so, <laughs> you know, and obviously with COVID, um, you know, because, because of COVID, people got accustomed to using Zoom meetings and things of that nature. So I'm like, you know what? Perfect timing. Let's go. <laughs> so yeah. it kind of came like full circle, right? And so. So you, you started the company, Gus, after COVID, right? It wasn't before COVID? After COVID. Okay. And, and I agree. It was like, perfect. This is it. It's uh, people are going to be comfortable with Zoom and let's do it. How? How was it? Were people actually comfortable doing the whole Zoom and then you showing them and yes or no or? Uh, <laughs> they were they were comfortable with it. Yeah, I mean okay. we, we we conduct a lot of transaction. I still bet in person during the install, and in most cases that was the first time they met me because you know I started as a one man show, um, and so I was doing everything. So after the sale, we would get on a Zoom or a call and. We, after the transaction was done during the install, I would just show up just, just to kind of, you know, say hi, six feet apart and all that good stuff. Um, and yeah, I mean, people were, were very okay with it. There's actually a perfect chance here for the audience to get to know what you and improver modeling, what do you folks do? Um, so we specialize in exterior replacement that's roofing siding windows doors gutters trim work we also do kitchens and we soon were thinking about getting into the bathroom remodeling as well but um kitchens have been as they say for lack of better words flying off the shelves <laughs> so there's so much demand and you know even now the, all the consultation and the meetings everything gets done virtually oh really yeah, and I'm, oh, uh, I don't know if, you, if you're going to get into the process and how we do things. It's kind of cool because it took us a few things, uh, you know, a few months in trial and error to perfect it to where it is now. But uh, it works. That's great. So how does it work? If you don't mind going into briefly. So they express interest somewhere online or and then if you can walk us through the steps, please. Absolutely. So all our customers just basically find us one way or another. We focus a lot on social media um, heavily. We're always there. We're very active. Um, we also run Facebook ads. We uh, also have other sources and we're working with somebody you actually met with. His name is Phil. Um, we partner with them with Flash Consulting and they're doing an amazing job on the back end with SEO and a flashlight and everything else. Um, so everybody that come through our desk is some is because they found us somewhere online. Um, and we also get a lot of referrals. Um, we've gotten, I would say, almost every customer that we've done work with or for have sent us at least one referral. So it's been amazing. And so to kind of walk you through the process on the exterior work, we still conduct everything virtually. So we have Chris, our director of sale, he gets on the phone or a Zoom, whatever they're comfortable with after the, the virtual consultation is confirmed. So we get on that call with them and then we go over product, we email them specs and so on and so forth and proposals. And if they like it, they sign up. If they have more questions, obviously we're here. Um, and then we just schedule the work. Now for kitchens is a little bit different. It's a multi-step process. It also starts with a virtual consultation. From there, we schedule a technician to go out and we do a 3D scan using Matterport, if you're familiar with it. Yes. You're in the real estate space, so you probably have heard of it or seen it yes. before. Yes. So we do the same thing for kitchens. We go out with our you know, $4,000 camera and we scan the entire area. Um, and then we measure at the same time. Then we have our inside designer, which we didn't have until recently. So we're now a full design build company. 
So our inside designer, um, kitchen designer, will do all the design for them based on the notes that we took on the virtual consultation. And then we invite them into our showroom to go over design product. As you can see behind me, you can probably see the samples. We have countertops, we have handles, we have flooring, we have different things. Um, so we invite them in, they go over the details, we go over the design with them, and if they decide to move forward, great. If not, again, we part ways as friends, and we move on. That's great. So uh, obviously doing the work, you, you have, I guess, third-party crews that you have relationship with that go out there to the client's homes and then do the work, whether it's exterior or interior of the house? Yes and no. For the exterior, I've, we've had a relationship with the crews for over 10 years. I literally met the windows and siding crews um, when I started at the first, very first company I worked for. Um, for the interior, however, we have our own crews. So oh. they, we drive, they drive our own vehicles, they go to the job site and do everything. They're all our own crews. Okay. So all the plumbing, all the electrical, all the demo, all the installation, everything with the exception of the countertop because we have to rely on fabricators. Sure is done in house. Wow. I mean, you, you, you probably couldn't have picked a better time to get in the remodeling construction business when COVID, because I know they just had a huge boom, everyone just at home. And they're like, oh, honey, let's focus on, let's remodel the kitchen or the bathroom or whatever it is. 100%. So during COVID or when COVID first hit, I think, in, at least from what I've seen, people either got in their own heads and thought the world is ending. Um, so you had that type of people and you have other type of people that saw the opportunity and said, you know what, let's pivot and let's blow up. And so <laughs> um, I was one of them, those people that saw the opportunity and started and made something good out of it. And to your point, because of COVID and the demand and when people were staying home, we're almost a recession proof industry, um, whether COVID or not. But you know, you're right. Because of that, we've seen a huge increase in the demand. The unfortunate part, you're dealing with high prices, lumber, roofing material, I mean, everything. We literally just got an email earlier today, cabinet, uh, kitchen cabinet pricing are going up 8%. And it's, it's, I don't see it stopping anytime soon, unfortunately, but people want it. Gosh. And which is which is part of the, the yeah. price increase because mm -hmm. of the, the amount of demand. Manufacturers just they're at a point where just don't care because people are just gonna buy it regardless. Are are, are most of your customers and clients guys where are they located? So we currently serve four different counties. Um, we're both from Maryland, so you're familiar with the area. So we serve this um, Montgomery County, Frederick County. Prince George's County and Howard. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and your office is in Rockville? We're in Gaithersburg. R Gaithersburg, right. okay. Yep, right in the air park in Gaithersburg. Yeah, very familiar with that area. Are you? Yeah, I, I, have, nice. a, I have some clients there. Very cool. Yeah, okay. yeah. Very central, especially like you said, you have 270 there, or you can yes. go to Howard County, you have it on the other side. You got the ICC here, everything is here. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Oh, you can grab a Cessna and fly somewhere. <laughs> yeah there you go you have the airport yep well one day you'll have that plane i'm sure my friend ah uh, i don't know i'm not a fan of flying but oh you're uh, not okay all right <laughs> yeah <laughs> more, more, more the yacht then i mean you know you did grow up in there the mediterranean go. so you like the water so there you go fun fact um i don't eat i don't even like seafood <laughs> <laughs> so but yeah yeah, I'm good with the water. I'm good with land. Flying, not so much. Okay. Yeah. Gus, what would you say drives and motivates you? Hmm. Um, my family, first and foremost. Um, I have an amazing support. I have an amazing wife. I have an amazing kids. You know, those are my main drivers. Um, aside from that... You know, I want to I want to build something that I'm that I'm very proud of. You know, people always say people start companies for two reasons, right? Either to uh, pass them down or to sell them. Whether I sell or whether I pass it down to the kids, um, at the end of the day, it just gives me a sense of fulfillment. 
that one, I did something that I'm, you know, built something that I'm proud of. And two, I started something where I am operating the way I believe needs to be operated in a sense that, you know, how we treat our customers, how we approach our, the leads, how we, how we take, uh, you know, all the steps we take to get to the, the sale and to get to getting the product and scheduling and hiring the right people to, to install the jobs and just give our customers a smooth transactions. Uh, because, you know, I don't know if you know this, but this is the second most complaint about industry. So. <laughs> is the um, second, what's the first? Auto repair. Oh, okay. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's, not, it's not easy getting those good reviews, basically. It is not. It is not at all. Yeah, unfortunately, a lot of uh, shoddy uh, contractors out there. Yes, that is true. That is true. I, I've come across clients of mine, unfortunately. I mean, I deal in the commercial real estate side of things. Um, sure. But uh, clients of mine, you know, have I, I have seen people, unfortunately, not do so well just because they select not the correct contractor. Yeah. 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 It you, happens all the time. Yeah. You just started the company two years ago. So how, how does your team look now? And how do you go about actually, I know you said you just recently brought in a designer. So how do you go about finding the right people in your team to put in the right place? Yeah. I mean, the best thing I can tell you is we've just been lucky. <laughs> um, I mean, it's been so hard to find labor, especially, right? Um, but to answer your question, we're now up to nine people in the company. Um, we have my, our very first hire was Jen, our office manager, which is amazing. Um, can't operate without her. Um, and the next, the second hire was Renee, which is our lead installer. So now we have two full uh, crews with two lead installers and a helper. We also have Chris, which is our director of sale, um, as well as um, we will also have, you know, a couple of people in between. They're 1099, but I consider them part of the company. Mm -hmm. um, but then our last W2 hire is Ron, which is our designer. He does all our branding. He does graphic design, the video editing, the photos, job site photos, as well as kitchen design. So he wears many hats when it comes to that stuff. Oh, that's but, good. Uh, and we're growing. And um, just re yesterday, speaking of commercial real estate, went out and looked at a second warehouse space because here it's all offices. Hopefully one day you'll you know, get a chance to check us out. Um, it's all office space here where we're at. We don't have any warehouse. We don't have any storage space, unfortunately. So we, we went out and uh, looked at the warehouse space. Oh, that's good. And, yeah. Yeah. You find anything you like? I did. Luckily, there's a unit behind the building, so, which was really my hope is to find something within the building so we don't have to, to go too far, you know. But luckily, there's a, a unit behind the building that's perfect for what we need. Oh, so, that's great. It'll be nice. Is it adjacent to you? Can you connect it or no? Uh, can I connect it? Oh, time? okay. Oh, that would have been perfect if you could. It would have been. Gus, what advice would you give someone? I know you started the business two years ago, so this is probably fresh. But if someone came to you and said, hey, Gus, I want to start, it doesn't have to be home remodeling, any type of business. You're selling a service or a product. What are a couple of pointers or suggestions you would advise that person to do? Um, so first, you have to have a mindset, that entrepreneurial mindset to start something. Um, if you don't, maybe it's best that you don't start something and that's okay too. You know, I think people, you know, uh, not, this is being an entrepreneur and being a business owner is not for everyone. You know, it's a lot of work. It's, it's a, it's, it's, it's a mindset. And so the advice I would have, if you're going to start something, just do it. Don't, don't overthink it. Just do it. Right. Um, don't overplan things. Don't wait for the perfect moment. You don't need to have all your ducks in a row. You will figure things out. There's always going to be something that you don't know about that may or may not hold you back. But mm -hmm. um, just, you know, put that on the back burner, go on. You'll eventually circle back for it and to, 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 to perfect that point, whatever it is. 
Um, the other thing that I would say is have empathy um, and don't expect your team to share the same mindset because, you know, I'm guilty of it myself where at times I feel like, oh, they're not working as hard as me. They don't care. I cannot have that mindset. So I've had to remind myself a few times, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I'm, I'm grateful for, for my team. I'm also very empathetic and I fully understand that not everyone in my organization is going to share the same mindset as long as the shares share the same vision. So yeah, the vision that, and the mission. That, that's true. They're, they're not owners of the company. You know, they're, they're an employee and therefore not to say all of them are going to be the same, but it, it will be different. Correct. hundred percent. Yeah. Is there any specific habit or trait, Guts Day, you feel that has helped you day to day, whether for business or on personal side of things? You see me smiling. Um, yes. <laughs> Honestly, what changed my life is going to bed early and waking up early. So um, prior to this, my bedtime was midnight on average, and I'm up seven, eight o'clock in the morning. Now my bedtime is 8.30 and I'm up between 3.30 and 4 every morning. And I absolutely love it. If you're a business owner, you've, you have to, you've got to do it. It's a must. You gotta get to bed early and you gotta get up early. You need, you need your sleep and you need your mornings, your early mornings. Wow, so, how, how has that helped you? Now, now you have the mornings or how, how has that helped you? Um, I have some me time. Um, Initially, I started making changes in terms of working out and lifestyles and stuff like that. Allowed me to do that, but then I've slacked a little bit. Um, but I do plan on getting back on that schedule. But it's, it's it's very important because you know we're we're we tend to just come up with an excuse of well I don't have the time to work out. I don't have the time to do this and that. Getting up early because so first it starts with having the mindset to actually go to bed early um the question that they need to ask themselves is like okay if i'm not in bed by 8 30 or 9 o'clock what am i doing where's my time being spent between 9 and 11 or 9 at midnight most likely on netflix what is netflix doing for you nothing at least yeah. the way and again if you want to watch netflix by all means i am not here to judge it's just not for me yes right i would much rather get my sleep get up early and get my me time so I can focus on me so I can be clear and so I can go on with my day and do what I'm supposed to do for my customers. What time do you typically end your day? I'm typically in the office until about five, six o'clock. Okay. So um, I try to go have dinner with a family every day. Sure. Um, spend a little bit of time with the kids and the wife and go to bed. Okay, that's good. I often go to bed before my kids do, the little ones. <laughs> <laughs> so um, they make fun of me. And, and that's old man, but it's all good. <laughs> so then you, you, your wife's left with them while you're in bed, or? No, they go to bed shortly after. Okay, okay. Yeah, even my, my wife is, is changing her, her bedtime as well, and it's, uh, it's working out. She also picked up a few new habits as well, meditating and yoga and other things. It, going to bed early allowed her to do those things. That's good. That's so, good. yeah. What, what would you say is your biggest challenge with your role today at the company? Mm. Um, it's the things that I did not know before that is a many challenges, you know, even though I was the VP of sales and marketing, but I didn't know everything. Um, I, I never, you know, finished school. I, uh, you know, the, the, and I, to, in my opinion, I, I didn't need to. And that's another thing that I will say to, to people, you don't need to have a college degree to start a business or to be a business owner or be an entrepreneur. You really don't. Um, I don't have a college degree and I'm not ashamed of it, you know, um, back to the things that are fingertips and that are available to us, right? It's like Google State University, YouTube State University, everything is available, <laughs> you know? Um, but as, in terms of challenges, it's the things that, I, you know, dealing and negotiating with vendors and distribution centers, things of that nature is something I never had to deal with before. Mm -hmm. um, I've always been a B2C kind of guy, a business to consumer. I never had to deal with a business to business. Yeah. 
side of things. So, and uh, I wouldn't say it's a, it's a, I was initially a challenge because, you know, you have to take a different or specific approach and, uh, you know, you have to have a different mindset when you deal with those type of people. Um, but, you know, I've learned yeah. <laughs> a few mistakes um, along the way. I, I strive from my mistakes. I embrace mistakes. I absolutely love them. Um, you know, they're all learning opportunities. And so if I'm not making mistakes, I'm not, I'm not trying hard enough in my opinion. <laughs> that, that's a very good way to see things. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what do you know now that you wish you would have known at the start of your business career? Um, I would say HR accounting, again, the things that I never had to deal with, how to, you know, um, work QuickBooks was a biggest, my biggest challenge, I would say, to be honest. So I'm now much more fluent with that language. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I would say, uh, yeah, that and HR. Well, the good thing is, I think you said you, you probably have someone in your team to help out with those responsibilities Correct. now, right? Correct. But you yeah. still got to know it as a business of owner, you know? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. It's good to have that. Um, but, you know, going back briefly about as far as you, you don't need education to run your own business. It, it just came to mind. I have a client who doesn't even, didn't finish. I, I don't know if he finished primary school, but doesn't even know how to read or write. Wow. And he's a successful business owner here. Yeah. It, 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 you just have to have the drive. You do. Yeah. You do. The drive and the work ethics is, is really everything. Work hard. Nothing is going to beat hard work. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Gus, when I say the word success, what comes to mind? Um, success is really what you define success to be. Um, you know, success may be me doing $3 million this year in volume as my second full year in business. Um, for somebody else, maybe $1 million in business that can be success. So it's really up to, it's, it's really up to you, the individual as to what you determine success to be really. Um, as long as you put goals in place and you work hard to achieve them. And if you want, if, and when you get there to me, that is success. That's great. Uh, I know prior to you starting Improve Remodeling, you were at two other remodeling companies prior to that. Did you have any mentors, whether growing up or childhood or even in the industry prior to you starting your own company? And if so, well, what did you learn from them? Um, I did. As growing up, unfortunately, no, I did not have a mentor. Um, I didn't have a very close, close relationship with my father. I didn't have um, any other father figure to fill that role for me. Um, now in business, I did have a mentor, but unfortunately we, we, we lost connection and uh, we were no longer on good terms. And so, and that's okay too. Um, I learned um, your people are everything. Um, even though I knew that, but he reiterated and because, you know, I, he, I am now full and full belief that one, you work for your people, they don't work for you. And then two, you treat them right and they stay around. And then three, you know, people typically don't quit companies, people quit people. And so, um, I would say that's, that's the biggest thing I've learned. I love that. I love that a lot. Coming to an end here now, guys, what does the future hold for you and the company? What does the next couple of years or five years look like? Um, so we, we're going to, we, we've been growing. Um, we're going to continue to grow. One thing that I don't want to do is I don't want to blow up. We want to grow steadily. We want to take the right steps instead of just going full force and everything. That's not my intention. I do intend to grow, but with a strategy, right? Um, and so, you know, 
the next thing we're going to do is we're going to introduce bathroom remodels um, along from kitchen. We're, we're, we're perfecting kitchen, the kitchen process currently. Once that where it needs to be, we're almost there. Um, we're going to introduce bathroom remodeling. And so, and obviously we're going to continue working on marketing. The next hire is going to be a production manager because currently that's what I do. Primarily, we have Jen running the front office. We have Chris running the sales and I do all the back end things. So once we have a production manager, that's going to free me up from doing all those things. So I can focus primarily on marketing, which is my passion. And it's really what I love to do on a daily basis. So. That's yeah. awesome. Uh, I know you mentioned earlier, you mentioned marketing and um, uh, I just thought about our good friend, Phil um, from Flash Consulting, yeah. uh, whose mm -hmm. episode just came out this week. So if you haven't heard it, it this morning, you sh oh, you did. Oh, OK. I did. Yeah. Go check it I out. He, Phil. He, yeah. Phil's a great guy. Yeah. So what would you say, I guess, out of lead flow? Are they coming mostly from you online or SEO or social? How, how does that look? So um, we do get a lot from it. So they're, they're paid leads, which I would love not to have them anymore. Meaning I'd I'm a huge fan of, of the organic flow. Sure. But I also know that it takes a while. And until then I have to, we have to continue investing in leads. Right. Um, we do qu get quite a bit of referrals. So between referrals and word of mouth, that's about half of our business. The other half I would say is Thumbtack, which is a lead source. I don't know if mm -hmm. you're familiar with it. Um, and Facebook, not just Facebook paid ads, but also um, like mom groups and stuff like that. Our office manager, Jen, and other people are, you know, constantly in those groups, you know, um, looking out for comments and people that ask for home remodel and things of the nature, just to kind of put a word out and just throw the website out. And we get a lot of calls from that, so. Okay, that's great. When it comes to the paid lead, are, I'm sure other are other remodeling companies also getting them. So you're sort of going up against other competitors per se when you're, or is it just so, you? So Facebook typically is just us. We don't don't really run into much competition, um, because they you know we 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 target with our ads, right? We were very strategic. And so they, they see the ad, they click on it. And it, typically it's just us based on the conversation that I've had with our customers. With Thumbtack, they have an opportunity to select multiple companies or just us if they want to, which is nice because there are other platforms where you, know, you the consumer, put your information in and they just send it out to four or five different companies. Whereas with Thumbtack, the customer gets to choose which companies they want to get an estimate from. Okay. which is nice. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier, as far as the, the paid leads, that's, that's something else. That's not Thumbtack. That's another platform, that is thumbtack. right? Oh, that is Thumbtack. It's Thumbtack. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, yeah. it, it, it brings to memory. One of our guests had, um, actually maybe two or three episodes ago, Tom has a pest control company and mm -hmm. I think over a thousand plus reviews, almost five star and thumb, Thumbtack. And wow. That's how he started and he scaled his pest control business. Now he has multiple offices in the DMV. And mm -hmm. he was saying, he was like, what stood out for him was literally I would have at 2 a.m. on my phone, someone from Thumbtack inquiring about pest control. I get yes. up and I respond immediately. We'll be there tomorrow or within 24 hours. And he was yes. like, I just blew my competition away. Because no one it would gave me such an anxiety that I actually, we, we now pay Thumbtack to respond back for us, oh. which is amazing because <laughs> that response rate or the response time yes. affects your performance because they rate you, right? They have different, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, stages, if you will, different levels. Okay. So we're now like a diamond level with Thumbtack because our response rate is so quick. We're not reality because to your point or to Tom's point, you know, we do get those leads on, on at 2 o'clock a.m. or 2 a.m. in the morning or on a Sunday afternoon when I'm just hanging out with the kids. You know what I mean? And yeah. oftentimes I, I can't, um, you know, I, unless I am on top of it, you know, 100 percent, you're not going to be able to those, you know, higher ratings within Thumbtack. So we, we opted to just pay them for that service to reply for us. And it's been great. Oh, that's but good. yeah, it's Thumbtack is, is a great resource for any service, anybody in service in the service industry. Yeah, um, we we do uh, about 
a third of our business from Thumbtack. Okay. Yeah. That's great. When you're not busy working with the company and also spending time with the family, what do you like to do for fun in your free time? Work. (laughs) That's your hobby, work? That's my hobby. (laughs) It's true. (laughs) You know, catch me on Sunday morning at 7 a.m. I'm in the office. (laughs) True story. Because you know what? Um, I, I heard that from Andy Frisella. I don't know if you watch him or if you follow him. Um, you know, to me, <laughs> um, work is more fun than fun is fun. You know, most people like to go out golfing and do different things. I like to work. I love to work. So, uh, you know, I would be the same thing, but then, well, let me ask you this then. How does your wife take it? Because at home with me, she's like, there's, you know, three boys and they have, I can't just be absent, but so how do you do it, Gus? She got used to it um, okay. because I'm such a hard head. <laughs> she sees the passion. She really does. Okay. And it, she's so amazing and so supportive. She fully understands why. And, you know, I mean, we, we went back and forth when it came to this stuff. But especially now more than ever that it's, you know, I wouldn't say my company, it's our company. Um, even though I'm building it, it's truly our company. So it's a, it's a, it's a little bit different. Um, and she, she's definitely much more supportive now. And like I said, I think she, she lost her battle because I'm, you know, like I, I don't have hobbies. I don't have bad habits. I don't do anything. I just, yeah. I'm just either at home with the kids and the family or I'm at work. And if I'm not with either like 7 a.m. when everyone is asleep at 6 o'clock and 5 o'clock and 7 o'clock on the Sunday morning, I'm working. (laughs) So, um, and I just love it. You you know, I'm similar in that type of way that sometimes my wife's like, hey, sometimes she goes out with her girlfriends here and there. I'm like, okay, go ahead, have fun. I'm I'm happy with, I'm I'm fine with the boys. And she's like, go with your friend or this and that. You haven't seen so-and-so. I'm like, yeah, but I'm okay. Like, I, I rather, uh, not to say that I don't want to see them because I do, sure. but I, I rather just sort of focus on other things and spend my time yes. elsewhere. Um, yes, like, like teach me more about automations. Like, what? <laughs> like, let's go. Like, put a, put a YouTube channel in front of me. Let me learn something new. And then, yeah. honestly, this is, that's what COVID did for, for me. Do me and for me, <laughs> which, is, which is great. I'm so grateful for it, you know. Yeah. Um, I knew nothing about digital marketing. I didn't know how how to get my first lead when I first started, truly. You know, I I literally sat in front of YouTube for hours upon hours and learned all about digital media, digital marketing and social media and, you know, how to build, I built the website for the company. I built all the social platforms, you know, just by learning on how to do it step-by-step. It's amazing. And that's great. And, 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 And look at the growth in just two years. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, only because, you know, honestly, anybody, anyone can do it if they just do it. So Anything is possible. Anything. Yeah. yeah. Because if people want to learn more about you and the company, where can they go out and find more information? Absolutely. So we're at improvemodeling.com. Improve with an E. So it's like improve with an E. So it ends with, it starts with an E, it ends with an E. E stands for excellence. Um <laughs> Uh, also, they can email me, Gus at ImproveModeling.com. Um, they can call the company, 1-866-IMPROVE, or my personal cell phone at 240-505-4944. Look at that. He gives you his own personal cell phone. Don't blow it up, please. 100%. <laughs> blow it up. I don't mind it. <laughs> Truly. Gus, thank you so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for having me. Of course, pleasure's all mine. Take care. Yeah, you too. Thanks a lot. Thank you.